and set everything to be recorded. Uh, so everything that you're seeing can also be enjoyed at a later date on our YouTube channel, and we'll get to that towards the end. So uh, thanks for coming. If you guys don't know me, my name is Andrew. Most of you guys all know me, but some of you might not. Um, I'm the Mac administrator here at Goucher College, so I'm in charge of every piece of technology that we have with a picture of a fruit on it. Um, so that includes labs and servers and the kiosk and the laptops that we hand out to people. And uh, I've been working with Apple technology since 2007 professionally, so I've been doing this for a little while and I'm kind of used to it. So uh, today we're going to talk about um, more of a big picture idea of working with Mac stuff. We're not really going to be talking about like specific like this is how you open up this shortcut and this is how you save this document and move things around because those are things that you can you know usually find through intuitive means or there's a help button or stuff like that. We're talking about the big concepts that are good to know the kind of stuff that sometimes IT people take for granted that we think everybody knows because we live in this world. And it's stuff that's very helpful for everybody to know how to do, especially when it comes to Macs, because it's usually different. Uh, so, everything's gonna be very fancy and move around because that's how I always do this stuff. So, it's not hard to feel overwhelmed when you're working with new technology. It's not hard at all. and. Uh, it's very common for people to get something wrong or get stumped by something. It happens to me, too, every once in a while. Um, it happened to me with that little camera right there, trying to get that to talk to my computer to import all the videos, because it spoke one video language and my software I was using spoke another. And I just spent the better part of a day trying to figure it out. So is there anything that, you know, with your Apple tech that you guys have been stumped by that you can think of? If you don't want to share, it's okay, but anything? It's cool. We'll keep going. It's fine. Yeah, what's up? You need to stop letting your dog wear it. <laughs> so, well, one thing to, to think about, I, I, this is my, one of my favorite guys in the world. I love Neil deGrasse Tyson. And his little quote about, I love being wrong, because that means in that instant I learned something new that day. And that's a great quote, because you can sit there and sort of keep bashing your head at the same problem over and over and over again and get frustrated. Or you can look at it as an opportunity to say, OK, I'm going to learn something. The next time I encounter this, it's not going to be an issue. And that's sort of the attitude that we always want to try and take when doing something new. Now, this is not working on my screen here. So we're going to cover a bunch of different things. We're just going to hit a lot of big picture topics. I would ask nicely that if you have a question that does not pertain to these kinds of things that we're talking about, um, just ask me at the end because i got a lot of stuff that I want to cover. And there's 10 million things that anybody could want to ask, and that's fine. But I want to get through all this stuff before we get to any of that. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is what is Mac OS? And also importantly, why should I care? Why does that even matter? We're going to talk about how to update your Mac and why you should do that. And as the guy who can see all the statistics of every Mac on this campus, I know a lot of people aren't doing it. We're going to talk about how to get software for your Mac. There's a couple different ways that you can do that. We're going to talk about how Goucher protects your Mac. And we're also going to answer that question of, can I still get a virus, which is a very hazy gray area question for a lot of people. We're going to address the idea of Office being different. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to use a Mac in a classroom, which is what I'm actually doing right now. And then finally, the big one is, what is Apple ID and does it work with iCloud? So when we made this list, we sat and thought about what are the things that people ask us the most often about using their Mac at Goucher, and we came up with this. So let's get started. Let's start talking a little bit about the Mac operating system and what that means and what that is. So Mac OS was introduced in 2001 as Mac OS X Cheetah. That is uh, a Roman numeral 10. It's not an X. I call it Mac OS X a lot too. But it's the 10th version of Apple's system that they run their computers off of. 
And everything that we've had since then is just an improvement of it. And they were all named after cats. There was cheetah, puma, jaguar, panther, tiger, leopard, snow leopard, lion, mountain lion. And then we switched to names of places in California, like Mavericks, Yosemite, El Capitan, so on and stuff like that. I'm a nerd. I'm a huge nerd for this stuff. Uh, it is a Unix-based operating system, which means that, in plain English, when you use a PC, the system that that runs is Windows. When you use a Mac, the system that that runs is Mac OS. But Mac OS is actually built on technology that's even older and more stable. Unix is an operating system that was developed a long time ago in, uh, on huge computers the size of this room for servers and network connectivity. It is very stable, it is very safe, it is very proven. And that's what Apple decided to build the Mac operating system on top of. That was the idea. And not that this matters to a lot of people, but it's certified Unix as of 10.6 Snow Leopard. So that means that, Brandon, what are you doing over there? <laughs> So what certified Unix means is that um, there are a lot of different computer systems that can be called a version of Unix. There's, you may have heard of something called Linux before, which pops up a lot. What this means is that if something is supposed to work on Unix, it will work on your Mac. For 99% of people, that does not matter. It matters for people like me a lot, because a lot of the stuff that we run to keep the infrastructure of this college going runs on that platform. Mac OS was developed specifically with ease of use in mind. Now I know people switching might not feel like that, but a lot of the idea behind how it was built was to sort of be intuitive. You click on things that are a picture to do what the picture shows. If you want a file to go somewhere or to do something with it, you drag it to where you want it to go. And oftentimes working with other systems, maybe not Windows 10, but older versions of Windows, it's not quite as intuitive, there might be more steps, so on and so forth. We're not used to it being as simple as, oh, just put it where you want it. So that was the whole idea of the development of Mac OS. There have been 14 major versions. And we are currently on version 10.14, which is called Mac OS Mojave. Um, it is really a good idea to be on that major version when those come out, uh, but a little bit after, and we're gonna go into that. And then each major version that's released, when they do a new version of Mac OS, it's free. They don't charge money for it. So even if you're using like a personal Mac, not a Goucher one, and you have one, and you want to update to the new operating system, it doesn't cost anything. You just download it off the App Store. Now there's two different ideas of updating your operating system. There's major versions, and then there's updates. So what are the differences? So a major version is when that number after 10 changes, and usually it has a different name after it. So like 10.14 Mojave is a major version, and that usually includes significant updates to features. So the kinds of stuff that they add would be things like Apple News, dark mode, Siri, big stuff that's really noticeable. Um, usually when you install one of these, it'll say, let's take a tour of all the new features and new things you can click on and new functions that you can do. Major versions also include significant changes to the system under the hood, so to speak. So, for example, they changed something called the Apple file system. They introduced new security features like Gatekeeper and XProtect. These are not things that a person normally deals with on their computer, but they are important to us because sometimes they can stop software from working or stop functions from working. So because of that, they can cause incompatibility. So what that means is when there's a big major version that comes out, we usually stop everybody from installing it for a while. Um, that's so that we can take the time to make sure that it works with everything like Canvas, that it works with um, Office and programs don't crash on it. Because the last thing we would want is for someone to install something that their Mac said, this is going to make everything better, and then you can't do your job anymore. So to protect everybody from that, you can't update to these major versions right when they come out. You'll actually see an email from the help desk come out that says when they are available. Uh, smaller updates, that would be the third number, so like for example, 10.14.5, which I think just came out. Those can sometimes include new features, 
like Apple Music or the Apple TV app. But usually what they are is they improve the performance of your computer and patch holes that are found in the security. So they're important to keep yourself safe. Make sure that nobody can access your data or your information. Generally, they don't break anything. That's the idea. When you already are on a major version of Mac OS, you can safely update it to its newest security release without worrying about stuff breaking. It can happen, but it's pretty rare. Come on. So how can you tell the difference? So this is a pretty common screen to see. Updates are available. Do you want to restart to install these updates or try tonight? That's OK. That's literally just your Mac saying, hey, there's a new bunch of security updates. There's those kinds of things. That's what I would like to install. If you see that, that's a good thing. You want to do that. But this one, whenever you see one a little bit more fancy that says upgrade to a new Mac OS with a name, that's the one that I would not recommend doing. In fact, on a Goucher computer, you can't do it right away. If you were to try, when the blocks are in effect, you'd actually get a message that says, you know, the system administrator will be notified that you tried to install this, and so it doesn't really matter. But that's the difference between the two. If your Mac is telling you updates, it is a good idea to do them. If it says there's a new version available, I would wait a little bit and make sure that everything you want to do on your computer works with it. What's up? Well, we it. it's not always a bad thing. So okay. we're going to talk about things that you should and shouldn't click on, too. That's part of this. We're going to get there. Um, so just a little bit more about updates, kind of reiterating what I said before. OS updates contain important fixes that protect you and your data, and they protect the college as a whole. So it's a good idea to do them. We don't want anybody accessing stuff they aren't supposed to. We do push out these updates to everybody's Goucher Mac automatically, but sometimes the timing on them is a little bit off. Sometimes your computer might talk to Apple before my systems get to your computer, so it's okay to install those updates yourself, too. So if you won't do them, my system will do them for you automatically. And the way that you would do them yourself if you wanted to is you just go to the App Store, just like you would on an iPhone or an iPad. You go to the App Store and there's a section for updates and it'll show you all the things that you can update. And if you're not in the practice of doing that, it's not a bad idea to update all your stuff every once in a while. And it's all in one place and it's all safe as long as you're doing it through the App Store. So. And they don't usually break anything. Every once in a while stuff can break. Not always something that we can do about that, but same kinds of things. So when we have the major versions, so whatever the new one that's coming out is after Mojave, I guess I'll name it after another desert or something. Maybe we'll get Mac OS Cactus. I don't know. Whatever it is when it releases, um, you're going to get a notification on your computer. I can't stop those. Let's pretend it's called Cactus. It will say, Mac OS Cactus is now available. There are 17 bazillion new features. It's going to make your life wonderful. You should install it right now. And you won't be able to because of the way that everything is set up. But unlike the other updates, the security ones where I'm taking care of your computer automatically and forcing it to do updates, we don't push these major versions out. So if you haven't upgraded in the last year to Mac OS Mojave, and you would probably notice, because your Mac is probably yelling at you to do it if you haven't, um, that's something that you have to do yourself. And you just click on, yes, it's okay to update and wait about, make sure you have about 45 minutes of free time that you don't need to do anything on your computer, and you're good to go. So if you update Mojave, will it update all the other things that you haven't been updating? So when you update to Mojave, then you're gonna have to do the more updates to Mojave after that installation, but it'll also update everything else that's behind at the same time. Okay. So. But it'll tell you. It'll, t it'll give you a list, yeah. So, do I have to go to, uh, Apple Store and you, 
you could go to the App Store and see if there's something else. Chances are also good that my systems that I have have probably said, hey, she needs updates, and pushed them to your computer, too. Oh, wow. oh, okay, gotcha. So, yeah. And then that last presentation, the last item there, blocked until IT is certified that everything works. That's what we try to do. So. Just a quick question. Yeah. Have have one of us look at it, um, just with the amount of yeah, it's not yeah. So it's we we've, we've got a lot of stuff to we've got 458 Macs to take care of that belong to the college, so not a lot of time. Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about software. So before we move on, does anybody have questions about updates or new versions? Yes, Judy. That's true. The new major versions of Mac OS, I missed that. I forgot that one. They come out around the same time every year, which is like right around, right around commencement, actually, is usually when they get released, which is a really bad time to upgrade your Mac to a new operating system here at Goucher. So typically at the beginning of summer every year, you'll get emails from Apple and notifications that a new version has come. And Typically, here at Goucher, we don't certify them for our computers for another like three to four months after that, just for time to make sure that everything works. Yeah, Steve. Um, now, sure, a lot of people that have iPhones are familiar with Siri on the iPhone. You mentioned that Siri is also on Macs. So there's, you know, there's a between the two. Not that I'm aware of. You can't customize the voice of Siri on Mac OS. Like, I made my phone Siri have a British accent. So I could get that like I'm Iron, Iron Man kind of feeling if I'm talking to it. Um, but that's really the only difference I've noticed with it. So. Cool. All right. Well, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, software, how to get software for your computer. So that is, yeah, I know. <laughs> that's, that's what MacBooks used to look like. I have one of those in my closet. So <laughs> That is uh, probably a 2003 model from when, uh, when the blue and white IMAX, when the, there were all those Jeff Goldblum ads on TV about connecting to the internet with your iMac. That's, that's the model then. I kind of miss the brightly colored plastic look. Like, I like the whole stainless steel thing, but the colors were cool. I like that. So starting out with Macs, um, and this only applies to Goucher Macs. So, some of this, so for personal stuff, this is, isn't really going to apply. Um, so Goucher's Macs are no longer imaged when you get them. So what that meant is before you got a computer from us, we would take it out of the box, we'd install all this other stuff on it and set it up and do all kinds of configuration. And it would take anywhere from an hour to two hours, depending on what you needed. And then we'd hand it to you and it would be pre-configured and ready to go. We don't do that anymore, but we sort of have the same effect. So what ends up happening is if you were to get a new Goucher Mac, we would hand it to you. It could be in a box. And it would ask you to sign in to your Goucher account when you turn it on. And then it's going to connect to our management system, which is called Jamf Pro, and look you up and install all the default stuff that you're supposed to have automatically, which is pretty nice. So this doesn't include anything that's like really specialty. So if you said to me, you know, it's to us when, when asking about getting a new computer, said, yeah, I need to make sure that I have this, you know, special video editing software, just to for just throw out an example. That doesn't come with it. That isn't built into the way this is set up. But what this does do is it includes things like uh, Office, uh, connecting to Box, a bunch of stuff for security, connecting to the networks all that kind of important things. But what if that's not enough? What if what comes with your Mac isn't what you need? So we have something that is on every Goucher Mac called Jamf Self Service. And that's its icon up there with that little four color um, square. That is on the dock or in the applications folder of every Goucher Mac. And what that is, is a curated safe collection of Mac software, or in plain English, it's a free app store of stuff that we know is good and okay to install. So what we have done is we have taken the time to go through and build this little custom app store that has things like certain printers on it. 
It has certain versions of software like the Box Drive client. It has connections to fix keychain issues and a whole bunch of other stuff just built right in. And all you have to do is go to self-service and click the little install button next to what you want and it installs it, it puts the license on your computer, it does everything for you automatically. Tried to make it really, really seamless. Um, this is a really, really helpful thing because it means you can install stuff without asking one of us to come visit you and go to your computer. Uh, we are, and in our interactions with people, we've learned that not a lot of people know this exists. So we just wanted to let everybody know that it's there. If there's something that's missing from your computer and you want it, check Jamf self-service. Check if it's there. Steve, you look like you have a question. <laughs> so, yeah, the icon is this four color square. Sometimes if you click on it, it changes to a Goucher Gopher. I tried to make it a Goucher Gopher all the time, but it keeps switching back to the square. So we'll figure it out at some point, but that's the, the least important thing. The other thing that's really nice is that when you download something from self-service, it downloads directly from Goucher servers, which tends to be a lot faster than connecting to the internet to download it. So for example, one of the things that's on there is our license of uh, Adobe CS6, Creative Suite 6, an older version, but that's what we have a license for for everybody on the campus. And it's really big, so downloading it through self-service is actually a lot faster than it would be if you were to try and download it from Adobe's website. And if you think something's missing, if you're on self-service and you think, I wish that was there, then send us an email at the help desk and we'll work on getting it there. It doesn't take a lot of time for us to build stuff into there, so. The other option that you have is you could download something yourself and install it with admin rights. So uh, if you have a Goucher laptop, you do have admin rights on it as of right now. And if you are um, on your personal computer, you definitely have admin rights because nobody else has any control over it but you. But you need to be a little bit careful about that. So you need to think about something before you install it. You need to just sort of take some time and think, what is this? What am I installing? Where did it come from? Because that's the number one thing that usually gets people. Because let's say you go to a website and it says you need Adobe Flash Player in order to watch this video. That's a pretty standard thing, right? But what if you go to a website that isn't really reputable and the thing that they're telling you is Flash Player isn't actually Flash Player, it's something else. That's the common thing that happens on the internet. That's how they get you with things like pop-ups and search toolbars and all those things that are really annoying and get really frustrating about computers. So think about it. If you're on a website and it says, you need to click here to download Flash Player. Well, does clicking you take you to Adobe's website? Because that's who makes Flash. If it doesn't, then it's probably not safe. Just you know, take a step back, think about it. Is this reliable? The other thing is, are there advertisements or other potential clues to this product being fake? So this is another thing I've actually seen in Flash Player a lot, is that there will be websites that say, you need to install Flash Player to continue. And what they'll install is actually Flash Player. But while it's installing, it's showing you advertisements for like online pharmacies and you know dating services in your area and stuff like that. And, Adobe is a huge multinational corporation. They don't need to put advertisements in their Adobe installers. So if you see something like that, that's a good sign to be something, something's not right. It might still work, but it might also introduce something bad to your computer. So normally, oh, and then the last one, is your Mac giving you a warning? So there is protection in your Mac for all kinds of bad software. And if you click on something that's on known to be malicious, your Mac will basically say, hey, are you sure? Like, do you really want to do that? And that's another good time to sit back and think, okay, is this really what I want to install? Is this legitimate? Is this real? So these kinds of things don't happen often, but if you just take a minute and think about where you are on the internet, what you're looking at, and what you're clicking on, instead of just saying, yes, I want this, yes, I want this, yes, I want this, because I do that too, um, you'll find that it's a lot easier to keep yourself safe from having something you don't want installed on your computer. Okay, so before I start talking about viruses and stuff like that, does anybody have questions about software or adding software to a Mac? So, 
So that could be a bunch of different things, actually. That could be the case, that site is not secure. Um, that could be... Like a big name website like CNN or something like that, for example. Because that happened with them recently. You know, the first, the first thing to check when that happens is actually to check if your date and time is set correctly. Because the way security works on websites to prove stuff is that they have a period of time that their security certificate is valid for. And if your time is off on your computer, it'll show that certificate is invalid. So that actually happened to me once and I wasn't even thinking. Everything that I went to said it wasn't secure. It could have been, it was goucher.edu sites, it was looking at the news, it was WBAL TV, it was Amazon. This thing tells me Amazon.com has their security together. So I was like, all right, something's up on my computer. And then I realized my computer thought it was 2004. And yeah, that would be why everything was showing up as unsecure. So that's actually a really good first thing to check if you see that. Now there are gonna be some things that are legitimate that do still give you that error. And that's just, Usually what that is, is somebody who's in charge of the website or the server just needs to update their certificate and there's nothing that you can do about that. But it will give you a lot of information about what you're looking at. So that's a good time to take a second and look. So like if, it were, if you were on, for example, Amazon and you clicked a link and you got that, are you still on Amazon? Because it shows you the full address of where you're going. So stuff like that. Cool. All right. So we're gonna move on a little bit and we're gonna talk about viruses. So uh, for the longest time, I used to tell people that getting a virus on a Mac was pretty much impossible and that's not true anymore. Used to be, but not anymore. But it is still pretty rare. So let's talk a little bit about how we protect Macs from that kind of stuff. Because we can protect you from a lot, but not 100% of everything. So there is something installed on every Mac by default called XProtect. And XProtect is Mac's... This is not just Goucher. This is every Mac, yes. So it comes with it. Um, and XProtect is Mac OS's built-in virus protection. And its job is to do what normal virus scanners do on other computers. The difference is XProtect is almost completely invisible. It doesn't tell you that it's there. It doesn't tell you that it's doing anything. And it also doesn't trust you to ask you questions about what it should do. If it detects a threat, it just removes it. It does not give you the option to be like, oh, I wanna save that. Now it's not gonna like, start deleting files or anything like that, but it's going to stop most problems before they become serious. And there's nothing that you have to do to keep it updated besides keeping your Mac updated. And that's all you have to do. So there are, um, it's built in. It updates with the OS, it's mostly invisible. Uh, so the other thing about that is that an important thing of having a virus protection program on a computer is the definitions, what it's supposed to be looking for. And those are actually sent to Macs almost nightly. Uh, it's all invisible, you don't see anything, but it's there and it's working to protect you. And it's very good at it. The other thing that we do is Goucher security exists to protect your Mac as well. Now, this wouldn't apply to your personal one. Um, so it protects you from spam email, because uh, I bet you've gotten those notices at night that say, you know, Exchange has prevented you from receiving this email. Would you like to release it to your inbox? I get those. That's a good thing. We don't want those usually. Every once in a while, tag something wrong, but not often. And then it protects you from known bad links. So I was trying to look at um, something to get some open source weird program running and I clicked on it and I got a Goucher security warning that said this, this is a you know, suspected malicious site, you can't go here. And I said, well, well, I guess I'm not looking at this anymore. And that just means that at some point our security systems have determined that that is something that you just should not be on on a computer here on campus. So now we're doing a lot. You know, we have XProtect. We have security set up in the management system. We have security on the networks. We're doing a lot to protect you, but it's not 100% foolproof. We can't make it 100% foolproof. So there's some stuff that everybody needs to look out for and everybody needs to be mindful of, and that includes us Mac users too. So the big one is threats that pretend to be legitimate, like I was talking about with like that Adobe Flash Player example. 
We can't protect you from phishing attempts. We try, we do everything that we can, but we can't make it so that if somebody sends you an email that says, you gotta click here and put your password in because we need it, we can't always stop what other people outside of the college are doing. So you need to be mindful when you receive emails. Is this really from Goucher? Is this really from somebody? Is this really a place that I should be putting my information in? And usually if you look, you can spot clues like uh, an example phishing email that went out was uh, one that looked like it was, it told people they had a package from FedEx, but they needed their name and social security number and credit card number in order to claim their package. And number one, that's just fishy on its own, right? But that email also had like a very fake looking FedEx logo. It didn't look right. It had words spelled wrong in the email. And if you looked at the address of where it came from, it came from something in Germany that was not FedEx.com. So, but that still tricks people because we're going fast. We're so busy, we don't stop to look. We don't stop to think about what we're looking at. So just take a second, think, is this real? Is this something that I should be doing? Every once in a while, um, we, send, we send little fun little fishing tests out to people in the campus. And it's a, it's a, it's, it's a good time. So <laughs> it's a good time. Are you But it's important, right? It's real, it's real, think of it like a fire drill. That's what it really is. It's that same idea. You want to be prepared because we can't, we don't know when it's going to happen for real and we have no control over it. So it's really good to be mindful about that kind of stuff and always be vigilant. So, and that applies to personal computers too. I mean, like not just Goucher stuff. It happens. Yeah. yeah. It what definitely between departments. <laughs> <laughs> Give like a fruit basket to the people with the least amount of clicks. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so another thing that to keep an eye out for is um, is malware. Now this isn't like really a virus, but what it is is it's a program that doesn't necessarily do hundred percent of what it says it does. And the two really popular ones that I see popping up a lot are Clean My Mac and Mac Keeper. And these look really good, right? They look like they scan your system for threats. They look like they're supposed to help you keep unwanted files off of your Mac. But what, um, I can only really speak for Mac Keeper because I took a deep look into it once, but what Mac Keeper really does is it slows down your computer and then tells you that you should spend $30 to buy the full version to make your computer run better. So, but it looks legitimate and it looks real and it's a real company that sells it. So, and there's nothing technically illegal about what they're doing. So if you're looking into, if you're using your Mac and you're like, oh, here's all these utilities that'll help me clean up my Mac and make them run faster, you don't need them. Your Mac's got all that stuff built into it. So, and it's invisible and it doesn't need you to tell it when to do that kind of stuff. So I would just avoid those kinds of things altogether. Every once in a while comes up that's legitimate, but it's not often. And then another thing that can happen is web browser extensions. And this pops up with like that Adobe Flash Player example that I mentioned. So if you go and you install th this fake Adobe Flash Player thing with the ads that I was telling you about, one of the things that you would notice is that every time you do a Google search, you start getting ads for whatever just popping up all over the place. That's not a traditional virus like you would find. It's not a gigantic threat that's going to spread from computer to computer but it is something that we need to go in and delete and get rid of. And it's really annoying too and obnoxious. So those kinds of things, as long as you make sure that what you're clicking on is genuine and real, you usually won't end up getting them. It's, it's pretty rare, but it can still happen. Another thing that's important to do is to keep backups of important data. So you could end up in a situation where something becomes corrupted or even as simple as I lost my laptop or it got damaged, something like that. So it would be really important to make sure that you have important data saved somewhere else. So at Goucher, we give people box accounts to save their data on. They can put as much as they want. 
for personal computers, you could put them on an external hard drive, or you could sign up for an account with Box or Dropbox or Google Drive, and those are free. There's hundreds of different ways to just keep a copy of, of important data. But it's important to remember that these are machines that can break or stop working, and it's always important to have a backup of anything that's important. Because we're good in, in Goucher IT. We're, I think we've got a real good team, but one thing we are not good at is recovering data from something that is broken or damaged. And that's really, really hard to do and really expensive to do in the best case scenario. Is boxing? Yes. So I forget what they said it was, 99.9% .9 uptime guarantee. So, yep. The data is uh, stored on multiple servers. There's copies. So even if the box had a catastrophic failure, they are backing up your backups. So box is a very safe place to put a lot of stuff. I have almost every important file I've ever created for Goucher saved on Box, and none of them are on my computer anymore, which is actually the way that I prefer to work. It's not required, you don't have to do it that way, but I think it's a really good way to, to work with files at Goucher, because that way, number one, I could just grab a different computer and still do my work, which is really handy. But also, it... It is. It is, but, but if you think about it, it's like, um, like important documents in real life, like your birth certificate or something like that. Like you, you might wanna have a copy of that saved somewhere safe, like in a safe deposit box. It's the same kind of idea. But we don't think about it because we don't think of these as machines that can break. We think they're gonna work all the time. Yeah, uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> and it went into a computer and it killed the hard drive and there was nothing that we could do. That's a very good question. You know more about that than I do. Uh, that, there is a uh, document management system um, that is being used by uh, financial aid, as an example, and the registrar uh, never made it to advancement because of DOLC, D-O-L-L-A-R-S. I know, I'm sorry. So, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a different mindset. We don't always think about it. So especially, um, I am really guilty of this because I got into Apple stuff a long time ago and it always did feel significantly more reliable than Microsoft computers did to me. I always had a ton less problems, personally. Uh, granted, when I had uh, Windows computers, I was also a, an obnoxious teenager who did everything he could to break them. So that probably had something to do with it too. Um, Brandy's mad now. <laughs> Also, older versions of Windows were, were pretty, pretty rough. So Windows 7 and Windows 10 are pretty good, and a lot of my problems with Microsoft Windows are no longer problems anymore. Uh, but you sort of get into this mindset when you've been using this different Mac system that doesn't hang or freeze or break up compared to what was available at the time. You're just like, well, this is impervious to anything. Nothing bad could ever happen, and that's, that's actually still not true. So, yeah, Steve. Time Machine is awesome. Time Machine is the best personal backup system that exists, and it's free. Um, now, I wouldn't, because for Goucher important stuff, I would use Box. But for personal information on a personal computer, if you were to buy an external hard drive, just any external hard drive from any store, and plug it into your Mac, it would say, oh, hey, this is a new hard drive. Do you want to use this with Time Machine? If you say yes, it will back up the entire contents of your computer to that hard drive. And then the next time you plug it in, it will back up everything that's changed, and so on and so on and so forth. Over time, what it'll do is it'll start eliminating old versions of files. So like if you had like a Word document, it might have 17 versions of that Word document if you've made that many changes. And it'll start getting rid of the older versions to save space. But it is 
the simplest backup solution I've ever come across. Um, it's pretty much designed for people who wouldn't want to think about how do I back stuff up. Makes it automated. Now the, the other thing to remember, to be a nitpicky IT person about all this, is that you're backing up information to an external hard drive, which can also fail at some point. But we are trained to think in worst case scenarios. <laughs> Brandy's laughing because that happened to us. Yep. You can't use that drive for anything else. Mm -hmm. So, so put a put a sticky note on it saying this is my time machine drive. You know, storage prices have dropped so much in the last couple of years that it's really not that expensive. For a one big enough to back up a Mac laptop, seventy to eighty bucks tops. So. Yep. If you keep an eye. If you keep an eye on Amazon, um, Amazon has gold box deals on storage about once a month or so, and you can get like a huge external hard drive for under 50 bucks, so, which is pretty nice. So yeah, it can't hurt to just keep a copy of your personal data so that nothing happens to it. All right, I don't know if, uh, that one should be pretty self-explanatory. Don't give your password to anyone. Um, Nine times out of 10, nobody will ask you for your password here at Coucher. It's exceedingly rare that we will need your password for anything. We would much rather have you enter it in than ever know what your password is, just for safety reasons. So if you get an email that says, hey, I need your password in order to you know, make everything work with your time card, nope, that's not real. <laughs> but that's also true of most services for personal stuff. Like, I saw a bunch of people get caught by a, a Gmail scam that said, they got an email saying, this is so-and-so from Gmail support, which number one, doesn't exist. Gmail support is almost all automated. I need your Gmail password in order to improve your service. And people were doing it, and then suddenly they were sending emails to all their friends about their new online pharmacy. So, so do we have any more security questions before I keep going on? Nope, cool. Brandon's laughing at all my little subtitles. So, <laughs> so uh, a question that we get a lot is about Microsoft Office for Mac, and is it different, and what does it do that's different, and how does it function? And uh, actually, recently, it, the, the feature parity between versions got a lot closer than it did, has in a long time. But some things are not included, like publisher. There is no publisher for Mac. It does not exist. Uh, it has not existed since about 2004, and that version will not run on a modern Mac. So if you want to do stuff like you would do in Microsoft Publisher, you can do it in Word. There's a, a mode in Word where, for Mac where it's page layout mode, and it lets you put stuff in text boxes and move them around and make it all pretty, and that's what I would recommend doing. Microsoft Access also does not exist for Mac. Uh, that's a database program. I have never been good at using it. I've never encountered a need to use it in my personal life, but there are a lot of people who really like Microsoft Access and want to use it. It does not exist for the Mac. And then uh, Microsoft Visio and Project. And the reason I know about those is because my dad bought a MacBook and then he called me and he said, Andrew, where's Visio and Project? And I went, what are those? So, but those are not included either. So uh, some niche features are missing or might work a little bit differently. Like Excel charts, you can still make charts in Excel, but the process of making them is slightly different. But it works the same way. And then pivot tables, that's some sort of arcane sorcery that I will never understand. But people like to ask me about pivot tables all the time. And I know that the interface for working with them in Excel is completely different to how it is on PC. I don't even really know what a pivot table is. I just know it's different on Macs. So, <laughs> I'm not a spreadsheet guy. I studied music. I count to four. <laughs> Come on. Sometimes seven if I'm feeling jazzy. So, so another thing that is a little bit different is uh, word macros, like those those. Word macros got famous for being a way to spread viruses, but also people were using them as a way to sort of like automate functions. They're just not even in the Mac version. You just can't do that at all. If you, if you don't know what a macro is, then you don't even need to worry about it. Uh, some of the plugins don't work. But one thing that is nice is that the files are 100% compatible. 
every once in a while there can be mild um, formatting errors. Like when I send something to Judy, sometimes it'll look a little goofy um, when she looks at it on her PC. But it's, it's not too bad. It's pretty, pretty darn close. And for most people's usage, there will be no missing features. Now, if you're somebody who could teach a class on how to use Excel or something like that, then yeah, you might be missing some stuff that you would be used to or want to have. But for most people using Mac Office, there's not anything that's missing that they need to have. And another question that I get, and one that was actually emailed to us before this presentation, is what about iWork? You might have seen this before. Um, Apple makes their own version of Office. It's called uh, iWork, and it's Pages, which is like Word, Numbers, which is like Excel, and then the middle one is Keynote. And you can use them if you want to. They're free. They come with your Mac. There's, there's a couple of catches, though, is that the files they make aren't compatible with PC software unless you specifically go to File and choose Save As and choose to save it as a Word document, an Excel spreadsheet, or a numbers, uh, or a, a PowerPoint presentation. So there's that extra step involved. You can use them, they're free. I like them. This presentation is actually made in Keynote instead of PowerPoint, which is why it looks so good. But, um, <laughs> I'm kidding. But uh, some of this stuff gets a little wonky when you convert formats too. So for example, I wanted the rest of my department to see what this presentation looked like. So I sent it to them as a PowerPoint file. I made it in Keynote. I went to file and chose save as and chose save as PowerPoint and sent it to them and it was real janky. It looked really messed up in Microsoft PowerPoint on a PC. I'm sorry, can you go back? Yeah. When you work in Keynote, mm -hmm. you have to save as? So my... Right, so I made this presentation in Keynote specifically because I don't have to share it with anybody. I knew that I was gonna make it on my Mac, I was gonna plug my Mac in here and present it, and I like the way that Keynote does like animations and design and stuff like that. And it's my preferred method of doing it. Uh, if I, when I sent it to everybody on my team, because not everybody on my team is a Mac user, I went to file and I chose save as PowerPoint to make a copy of it that was a PowerPoint file but it didn't come out exactly right, and that's the problem that you get with these. So I would say for collaborative Goucher work, stick with Microsoft Office. But if it's something, like on a personal computer, it doesn't matter. Um, if it's something that I'm not sending to anybody, like, like this presentation was just to give here, you then, save it as well. yeah, it doesn't matter, so. I used it for this presentation, yep, uh, because I like the way that it works better than PowerPoint. All right, I just want to explore it. Yeah, it's good stuff. I, I think it's, yep, and they are, they're free from the App Store, which is really cool. So another thing that's interesting is if you are a iPad or iPhone user, that they have free versions on those too, which is also nice. Now granted, so does Microsoft Office, so you know, six of one, half dozen of the other, so. I'm actually using the Keynote remote app on my phone to control this presentation, which is kind of nice. It shows me what the next slide is and all that stuff. If I want to be really fancy, I could tap my watch, but sometimes the connection doesn't always work with that. So I think out of the three of them, I don't use pages very much. What is this one right below Keynote? These are the same, so this different icon. So this is what it looks like on an iPad, and this is what it looks like on a Mac. So. Uh, I don't use pages for much of anything. I just type up a document in Word. And I don't use numbers because I don't make spreadsheets forever. But I do use Keynote because I really like the way that it does presentations. And I like the, the mobile phone connection. Now Steve, I think that you can probably control, Steve would know this because he's our office expert pretty much. But I think that you can do the same thing in PowerPoint. I guess, like. Probably. Yeah. I feel like it would be a giant mistake if it wasn't there. Okay, so a real quick thing to remember is about using a Mac in a classroom, which is what I'm doing right here. So what you wanna do, this is just a common question that we get, is people will hook up, Now, obviously I'm not talking about if there is a problem with the way the podium is set up. Let's just say that everything is connected and turned on the right way. How do I get my Mac to talk to this projector? 
what you want to do is you want to mirror your display and system preferences. You go to system preferences, choose displays, and you get this window. Uh, it is this color because the screenshot that we took was in dark mode, but it might not always be this dark black. But you want to make sure that you check this little mirror displays button, and then whatever is on your screen is what's on this screen too. And that's the best way to give a presentation to people. You can also use the shortcut Command plus F1. It does the exact same thing as going to that menu and checking that box. It's a really nice quick way to make sure that whatever you're displaying on your screen on your laptop is what's on the screen in your classroom. That, that stumps so many people. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, because usually automatically it will connect. Yeah, it's one of those things where like if you hook it up to a projector and you're not getting what you expect, do that command F1 and you should be good to go. Do you have another question? Yeah, I do. What's so up? Or I like to avoid ever having to do that. So are we gonna get some of those uh, some of these uh, computers in the rooms? That is that's a question above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> So now we're going to uh, talk about something that has been confusing people that I've talked to about Mac stuff since 2007, which is Apple ID, iCloud, and keeping it all together. And this is a question that I got when iCloud was first introduced and I worked for Apple that I got at least three times a day. This is a question that I get multiple times a day here. This is probably one of the most confusing things about working with Apple stuff, so we're just going to try to make it as clear as possible all at once. So the first thing is, what is an Apple ID? An Apple ID is just your username and account with Apple services. That's all it is. Apple has to have a cute name for everything. So they can't just call it your user account. It's your Apple ID. You would use that to sign into, oh, I'm going out of order here. Uh, Apple IDs cannot be controlled, managed, or reset by Goucher. So you've got to do it yourself, because we don't have any control over Apple systems. It's not your Goucher ID, it's on their servers. So if you are having issues signing into an Apple system, you just got to remember to go to iforgot.apple.com, because everything at Apple is I something. So iforgot.apple.com will take you to a website where you can go and reset your Apple ID. They give you about nine different ways to do this. I just had to help my mom do this uh, a couple days ago because she wanted to install an app on her phone for the first time in four years. And it's, we had to get a text message sent to a different phone and then a security code and it can be kind of involved but it walks you through the process. So you use an Apple ID to access the App Store including for updates and free, free programs. You use it for iTunes the mobile app store, the Apple store, iBooks, pretty much if you are going and connecting to a service that Apple provides, you are using your Apple ID to sign into it. And you can use the same one for all of them. So you don't have to have one for iTunes and one for the App Store and one for the Mac App Store. You can just have the same one. Apple IDs are 100% free to create, but 99% of the time you're using them to spend money. So that's what most of the, that's what they pretty much exist for is to log into stuff. It is not uncommon for an Apple ID to ask you to update your payment information even if you don't buy anything. Sometimes it'll ask you, "Hey, your your credit card's expired. You need to put a new one in here." It's not that you're actively buying something at that moment. They just want to make it real easy for you to buy something. Yes. Yeah. That is correct, yes. 
So if you buy a free app, if you get a free app off the App Store, it is, it is technically selling it to you for zero dollars in their system. So, so we know what Apple IDs are, so what is iCloud? Because they're not really the same thing, except for that few times that they actually are. So iCloud is, was introduced a while ago as a paid service called Dot .Mac or MobileMe. And uh, Brian and I, as the Apple retail alumni, know how fun it was to try and convince people that they needed this and they should buy it. So <laughs> the idea of it is that it was planned as like Microsoft Exchange for the rest of us. So it was set up to make it so that you could sync information between multiple computers and devices really easy. Well. Everybody in this room is a Goucher employee. Everybody in this room has a real exchange account. And therefore, we don't really need to worry about Apple iCloud for personal use. That's just an opinion, though. Uh, iCloud is no longer something that you have to pay for just to get access to. You just have to pay to even get in the door. Now you get an iCloud account, and it's free. The problem is, is that the amount of storage space that they give you on your iCloud account is not really enough to be super useful until you start paying for it. It has gotten a lot cheaper. They sell, I forget exactly what they ch charge, but they sell it in like, I think 500 gigabyte chunks now, which is enormous. Yeah, so I don't have one uh, at this point. It, I just didn't think it was necessary, but we'll talk about all the things that it does. So um, iCloud was designed to allow easy sync of information between Macs and iPhones. That was its original purpose. So if you added a contact in your phone, it would be in your address book on your Mac and so on and so forth. But like I mentioned, Excel, or Excel, Exchange, Office 365 is already doing that for our Goucher's information. It was later expanded to include iPads, Microsoft Windows, iPods, and now even Android devices. So if you have something that counts as a computer, you can connect it to iCloud. So it has, these are the things that it does. So, and there's a lot, right? It, please ignore my 4,000 unread messages. I don't actually use that email for anything. It's become a junk mail. Brian's judging me so hard. So, <laughs> you should see my Gmail. It's at like 17,000. Um, so yes, there are mail, contacts, calendar. That's straightforward, right? They give you an email address, and you have mail, contacts, and calendar attached to it. Then there's photos, so if you turn that on, what that means is if I were to take a picture with my phone, it would keep a, oh no, I touched the screen. There we go. If I would uh, take a picture on my phone, it would automatically upload it to iCloud so there's a copy of it. I think there are better free solutions to that out there, uh, but that's an option for you if you want to do that. There's iCloud Drive which works like Box or Dropbox or OneDrive. But, you know, you have a free Box account with Goucher. You don't necessarily need to use that. Do I need to get out of here? Okay, so I'm going to get through these last things real quick. Um, so really, the idea here is, rather than going into what all the 100% of the features are, iCloud works best for personal data synced between multiple devices. I wouldn't worry about using it with the Goucher equipment at all. I don't think there's a reason to. All of the functions that it does are also already being done by our Office 365 accounts. For personal data, if you think it's really important to have your personal stuff synced between an iPhone and a personal Mac, then I could see maybe worrying about iCloud, but I have nothing of any importance there. I could delete my iCloud account and I would be fine. So here's the big things that I wanted to, to get across about all this. So the first is that you need an Apple ID to use iCloud. Remember, you have an Apple ID. That's how you sign in to get into Apple systems. You do not need iCloud to use Apple ID. So your Apple ID should probably be a personal email address that you'll have access to forever. Come on. You should only have one Apple ID. You gotta make it quick. No. You should not use your Goucher email for an Apple ID. You should use a personal email address. Here's why. Goucher does not distribute software that's attached to an Apple ID. 
The only stuff that would ever be attached to an Apple ID is something you personally bought. If you decide that you would no longer like to work at Goucher, you no longer have access to that Apple ID. So your Apple ID should always be a personal non-Goucher email address. If you have multiples, you can contact Apple support and they will help you merge them together into one. You got to talk to them on the phone for that one. You can't just send them an email or anything like that. Um, Apple support is in Austin, Texas, so it, there's not like a language barrier like some tech support calls, so I would recommend doing that if you have not. And then the last big point is that an iCloud ID could be used as an Apple ID, but you probably shouldn't. It should be a personal email address. It should be, like we talked about, a Gmail, a Yahoo, Comcast, whatever, something that you're going to have access to forever. Because what if you're like me and decide, I'm not using this iCloud account, I'm going to cancel it. Well, then suddenly I can't get to my Apple ID. How am I going to play Angry Birds 2 without buying it again? Like, that's a serious problem. <laughs> I have one question. Mm-hmm. 